space communication. These will be among the main topics for dialogue. There's a moment at which we choose to recategorize something as waste. So it might be that it gets broken or it gets lost or it gets stained or it gets shrunk or it gets damaged or whatever it is. At that point, rather than fixing it, cleaning it, doing whatever we would need to do to bring it back into use, we recategorize it as waste. Katie, so good to see you. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Very well, thanks. Very well. So you're in Cornwall. I am, and it's raining here. It looks much sunnier where you are. Yeah, well, it's been raining all day, actually, but the sun came out this afternoon, so it's kind of rainy season. It rains for 12 hours, and then the sun shines out again, so can't complain. That's a pretty good ratio. Yeah, it's good for my vegetables, so I, I, I like a bit of rain. It's been quite a dry <laughs> summer, so it's good for the garden. Yeah, and how's things in Cornwall then? So uh, you, you were mentioning earlier that you've got a, you're in tier one lockdown. So unlike the rest of the country, it's a, a little bit easier for you. Yeah, we're the only people on mainland Britain who are in tier one. I think just because we're on a peninsula and we're quite rural, the population is quite dispersed. But I mean, to be honest, I work from home and my social life largely revolves around Netflix. So it doesn't make a huge amount of difference to me either way. But um, yeah, we're very lucky to have a bit more bit more freedom and, and lower infection levels than the rest of the country. So I'm feeling grateful for that. Good, good. So congratulations on your book, by the way, Wasted. Um, Thank you very um, much. Really incredible. So before we, we get into the book, um, could you just give us a bit of background into who you are, what you do, and kind of what has led you up to creating a book on Wasted Design? Yeah, I mean, it's funny, isn't it? Because Steve Jobs says you can only connect the dots looking backwards. And I think that's absolutely the case with this book. Um, I grew up in Cornwall, you know, out on boats, up on the moor, on the beach. Um, and I think a sense of protecting the natural environment was just instilled into me from a very young age. So we used to fish for mackerel and we would throw back the little ones, you know, and we would have picnics on the beach and obviously take all our litter home with us. You know, and I think I think that respect for the natural world was just something I grew up with. Um, I then went off to study biology at university for my undergraduate degree, very much inspired by David Attenborough documentaries and sort of um, just a love of kind of living things, I think. Um, I then worked in advertising, marketing and communications for 10 years, which at the time felt like, like a complete sort of tangent uh but actually i learned how to communicate you know that's a really important thing I, I learned during that time was how to get a message across really simply i mean specifically in advertising people there's a quote and i can't remember who said it but it's that people read what interests them and sometimes it's an ad you know you've really got to capture people's attention in advertising um and sort of 10 12 years into that career i actually got made redundant on a post-it note and um, thought my whole world was over and, you know, thought this is the end, it's terrible. But actually I hadn't been loving that career for a while and I'd long held uh, a dream of becoming a writer. I mean, since the age of five, I'd wanted to write books and then at university I'd wanted to write for The Guardian and, and sort of never really done anything with it. And by this point in my career, I'd started writing a blog. And so I thought, well, maybe this is my, my chance to become a writer. So. I did, that was about 10 years ago, became a craft and design journalist, um, writing for sort of Guardian Observer, Elle Decoration, Crafts Magazine, Design Milk, Design, those sort of titles. Um, and I've always been really focused on purpose-driven craft and design. So I've always been interested in the role that craft and design can play in making the world a better place. But until recently, I had a really wide remit for what that meant. And in the last few years, I've sort of thought, right, I need to really kind of focus. What do I mean when I say purpose driven or good or whatever it is? So I went off to university, went to Oxford to do a master's in the history of design and sort of set myself the question, can craft save the world? Which is a slightly ridiculous question, but, you know, could it? Could I really do good with this, this writing about craft and design? And I realised 
through papers in all sorts of things from feminism to activism to the plastics crisis that actually craft has got a really important role to play in bringing about a circular economy uh, for, for lots of reasons. Um, and when I, so I sort of wrote my dissertation on repair and sort of explored all of those sorts of things in various papers. And then when I'd finished my dissertation, the publisher of my last two books got in touch and said, would you like to write a book about waste? And I was like, would I? <laughs> I think she thought I'd be keen. I don't think she realised quite how interested I would be in, in that topic. Um, and so, yeah, Wasted came about as a way of exploring that part of, of the circular economy. And obviously it's only a very small part. Um, but I jumped at the chance to explore, uh, you know, all the amazing people who are using waste as a raw material, keeping objects and materials in use, um, and sort of explore that part of what I hope will be, you know, a much longer exploration of the role that craft can play in the circular economy. Amazing. So, so this term of waste, then, it, it's definitely something that's clear after reading your book, that it's the term waste, the meaning of waste, that needs a radical rethink in terms of, you know, waste isn't something we just throw away. It's actually a, a material. It's a surplus material that could have a second life. And these types of things and I think in day-to-day -day life you know within the mainstream people just aren't thinking about this they're just throwing it away and somebody else will take care of it so this this notion of re-evaluating what waste means is something that we definitely need to tackle and how do you think we sort of begin with that in terms of unlearning and learning you know the value of waste how do you think we can start making impact in that yeah I mean it's really interesting one of the things I explore in the book is this idea of we throw things away but where is a way you know, it's just, we just sort of put it in a bin, put a bin bag on the edge of our road and it's gone. We don't have to think a lot further than that. But one of the things I explore in the introduction to the book is that waste is not a fact, but a category. There's a moment at which we choose to recategorize something as waste. So it might be that it gets broken or it gets lost or it gets stained or it gets shrunk or it gets damaged or whatever it is. At that point, rather than fixing it, cleaning it, doing whatever we would need to do to bring it back into use. We recategorize it as waste. And that's what that recategorization is what drives our desire to be rid of it rather than anything that is inherently in that object. And so I think to, to sort of um, to challenge that recategorization and encourage people not to move things over, um, I think there are three things we need to do. One is I think we need to look at language. So as I'm sure you noticed in the book, almost everybody I interviewed said, we've got to stop calling it waste. You know, these are raw materials. One man's trash is another man's treasure is, you know, where the subtitle of the book came from. And I think that's really true. So I think there's a, there's a semantics job to be done there, which is actually really important. I think the power of language um, is not to be underestimated. I think there's also a material literacy job to be done. So I think within the design industry, I think, and within the design education, I think designers need to know a lot more about materials, not just about what they can do for them in the making of the product and the answering of the brief, but what happens to them afterwards. So there's an awful lot of designers I talk to and say, oh, my products are super environmental because they're designed to last for generations. And I'm always like, great, then what? You know, after your object's been handed down from generation to generation over maybe 500 years, you know, we, we tend to think in terms of our own lifetimes, but plastic lasts for at least 500 years. So we've got to sort of think what happens after that. And then I think the other thing is thinking about that end of life stage right at the beginning. So 80% of the environmental impact of anything is baked in at design stage. There's only a limited amount you can do after that. Um, and so I think thinking about things like design for disassembly, you know, whether things can be taken apart. So many of our sort of modern mass produced objects have so many different materials that are stuck together and treated in a way that means they can't then go back into the natural environment in a way that's regenerative. Um, and all those things have to be considered up front. It's a difficult thing for a designer to do because you're you know, putting your heart and soul into this beautiful new object. The last thing you want to think about is what happens when someone chucks it into landfill. But I think, I think that's a really important part of this kind of shift to a, to a more circular economy. Yeah, it's interesting. And I guess when you look at the sort of design, the role of the designer and you know, what's generally called the design principles, it's okay, well, aesthetically, it must be pleasing. You know, people must want it, form, function. 
but where does sustainability come there? Because surely if you're creating something which is damaging to the environment, quite often damaging to people, and as you mentioned, you know, whether, regardless to whether it's going to be passed down or not, something has to happen to it in the end. That isn't good design because f fundamentally, if you're harming the planet, you can't, you know, really, it can't be good design. But, 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 I, but there seems to be, you know, without p finger pointing, there just seems to be the system that we're in is that's just how we operate. And it's, there's a lot of unlearning to be done then. Do, do you see designers moving more towards this? Or how can we, how can we sort of look, re look at that and, and just like, reevaluate the design principles to ensure that what we are creating is sustainable if it's not then it needs to be relooked at yeah no, i i think this is something that's definitely changing so 10 12 years ago when i first started writing um about design i used to focus specifically on new designers so i'd often be looking at graduate shows you know people who just started their, their businesses and oh man, there was so much optimism and hope. And, you know, these guys were going to save the world. And then sort of as I followed their careers, that didn't quite happen. You know, they'd sort of get a job for a big company and, or, you know, they wouldn't have left university with the tools or resources to set up their own businesses. And, and what happened was they were getting into big companies and just didn't have the support within those businesses to kind of follow through on those ideals. Now I think, you know, and some of them, would some of them was ha would have those fights, which is a very difficult thing to do as a junior designer in a big company. And some of them would be successful. Some of them would sort of be beaten down. But now I think what's happening is those big companies are putting sustainability in our brief stage. You know, it's it's the, the demand has started to come from clients and specifiers and consumers. Companies themselves are starting to become more responsible. And so what I'm hearing now from these young designers is that the doors have finally opened. And actually, one of the projects in the book, um, the Castal Rugs, that was a perfect example of that. Their in-house designer, who was a relatively young designer with sort of big dreams of becoming more sustainable, was given the brief of what do we do with all this waste yarn? You know, how can we solve this problem? And so you've got a company that's willing to be open and honest about its waste streams and is willing to hear about the solutions to that problem. And you've got a young designer who's come through an education system at a point at which this stuff, you know, it's on pretty much every brief at university now. You have to have demonstrate some form of sustainable responsibility. Um, and so I think those things are starting to come together now and we'll start to see that sort of come through the system. But it's interesting, um, what you said about the sort of criteria for good design. And I think Kate Fletcher writes about the craft of use. And, you know, we tend to think of a product being finished the moment it hits the shops. Whereas actually what Kate Fletcher is saying is it's got this whole life beyond that. And as consumers or citizens or, you know, whatever you want to call us, we are part of a co-creation process. So she talks particularly about clothes and textiles. And she's sort of saying, you know, we tend to think of the clothes on the catwalk as being the finished object or in magazine shoots or whatever. But actually clothes don't become alive until our bodies are inside them, you know, and you get those creases at the front of your jeans. And I think the raw denim movement's really interesting in this way and that there's an idea that as consumers, the, the care and the life that we put into our clothes is part of the design process. And I think that's an interesting shift that's certainly happening in academia and certainly happening in sort of various niche parts of the design industry. But I would like to see that become more widespread. And, you know, the ideas of care and maintenance and repair being seen as part of craft and design. Mm. So, so brands looking at the sort of long term and saying, OK, well, we, you know, we expect you to own this garment for the rest of your life. And we're going to be here for you when things don't go too well. You, you know, you tear it or you need to repair it or you want to return or something. Or even if you don't want it anymore, there's somewhere you can send it and you know it will get handled correctly and upcycled. Yeah, I think that's super important. I think that's really important. Is anybody doing that? Have you seen anyone doing that successfully? Yeah, I mean, there are lots of brands. Patagonia, mm -hmm. Finisterre. I've just bought a pair of jeans from a company who will offer lifetime repairs. And I think... Yeah, it's certainly starting to happen. Um, I think there are companies, I mean, Ikea have just launched a take back scheme where if you don't want your Ikea furniture anymore, they will buy it back off you and, and sell it as second hand. And I think it's that sort of um, responsibility for the lifetime of a product. I think a lot of the problem is that manufacturers sort of wash their hands of it at the moment it's out of their factory. Whereas actually I think we need them to start taking responsibility for the lifetime of the product because there are costs, you know, environmental costs and the costs of fixing that 
that are associated with those products that are, at the moment are externalized. So companies can make things very cheaply because they're not having to deal with that externalized cost. Whereas actually, I think we need to bring that cost back in and then, you know, that will have two effects. One is that the companies will have to deal with that stuff. Also, it will make things less cheap. And I think whilst it's very, very important that people on all income levels can afford what they need, I also think we've we've reached a point where we don't value things like clothes and single use items because they've become sort of dangerously cheap. And that's because so many of the environmental impacts have been externalized from the sort of cost process of them. Yeah. And 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 do you have you seen a big shift in consumers in terms of demanding more sustainable products and and put and sort of that that as you mentioned sustainability is you know high up on the agenda now with brands you know whether they're genuine about it or not i think they're realizing that consumers definitely want this now and yeah. hopefully they're going to start investing and really looking into how to trans transform into more of a circular economy are you seeing anybody any brand successfully sort of leading in that space in terms of actually creating a brand which is um, fully circular or do you think there's still a long way to go? Yeah, I mean, I think I think there is still a long way to go and I think a lot of this stuff is being driven by consumer demand. I think there's far too much greenwashing out there. There's far too many people claiming, I mean, the one that drives me absolutely nuts is when people describe the material something's made of as recyclable and it's like, yeah. Well, great. You know, it's not recycled, though, is it? And that's what and I think a lot of people just will quickly look at something and think, great, this is recyclable. And, you know, I think something like nine percent of plastic, nine percent of the plastic we've ever produced has actually been recycled. So I think there's, you know, and, you know, there's lots more. There's a lot around carbon at the moment and kind of this idea of being carbon, carbon negative or carbon positive, which are terms that are used interchangeably as if they mean the same thing, which they don't for a start. Um, and, you know, lots of stuff around carbon offsetting, which is problematic. You know, if I use a certain amount of carbon today and then I plant the amount of trees that in their entire lifetime will recoup that amount of carbon, that's not actually super helpful. And that's assuming those trees survive to maturity. And I think the other problem with carbon offsetting is people then think, great, I can make as much carbon as I want because I've offset it all. And it's like, well, no, really, you need to be planting trees and reducing your carbon footprint, you know. So I think there's a lot of greenwashing around. Um, and I think the ways we can get around that are things like B Corporation accreditation, Soil Association accreditation, uh, GOTS, which is an organic textile association. I think we need sort of external certification so brands aren't marking their own homework quite so much. Well, I guess it's I guess there's a conversation being had and it's even though there is a lot of greenwashing happening for sure, which, which isn't good. It's good to see that people are talking about it and these corporations are starting to go, mm, maybe we should start doing something. Um, and, yeah. and I'm seeing a lot here with Aqua, which is a big, big problem here in Indonesia. They were kind of trying to do things, not very successfully and nowhere near enough, but it's it's good to see that people are actually sort of talking about it and, and now consumers are demanding it. And, and it's funny because we, I mean, we built a hotel here in, in Bali and we spent seven years building it. We work with OMA, you know, a big architectural building. And the one thing that actually got the attention was all of the amenities in the room because we we, we built a lab. Um, we went zero waste five years ago and or zero waste to landfill. And, and in order to sort of do that, we worked a lot with suppliers and, you know, did a, did a lot of sort of behind the scenes work. And we thought, okay, let's let's sort of build a lab where we can showcase some of the things we've been making. And we were sending a lot of food waste to the lab and a lot of different um, recycling initiatives that were happening around the island. And we built all of our amenities from you know from down the restaurant waste or the, the waste from 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 the island. And that was the one thing that everybody gravitated to, towards. They were they were like, forget everything else. They're like, wow, you made this from this, you know. And it was as 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 what you're um, talking about in your book. It was that notion of creating something from waste. It just, people just connect with it. They're just like, wow, I can't believe you made that from, you know, waste yeah. coconuts or waste plastic from the ocean out front. Or that, that was what somebody had for dinner, you know, a month ago. And now it's sitting there as a beautiful box or something. So I think people, people want this. And I, I just feel like they don't know how to transition or they don't know where to sort of buy a lot of these types of things. So I feel, I do feel even though it's in its infancy and there's a long way to go, certainly these trends are happening and they're good trends you know and brands are going to have to follow otherwise they're going to become literally extinct within the next five years unless they unless they act fast you know for sure and i think there's also 
I think kind of the flip side of that is I do think the whole the whole reduce, reuse, recycle concept puts all the emphasis onto consumers. And I think there's an awful lot of consumers, you know, getting their knickers in a twist about, you know, should I be using this thing or this thing and kind of focusing on the details. Whereas actually one of the things that shocked me in the book is for every sack of rubbish you or I put out on the curb for the bin man to be collected, the, the manufacture of the contents of that sack, so all the industries that go into that, mining, agriculture, manufacturing, have generated 70 sacks of waste, seven zero. So I think one of the big things consumers need to be doing is pushing back up the chain and demanding better from governments and, and big business, because that's where we're going to make the big shifts. You know, it's kind of initiatives like yours, rather than an individual person making banana bread from a, from a brown banana, which is great like I'm all for personal agency we need to all get our own houses in order but I think um I think there's a danger you know Shell a little while ago put a thing I think it was last month put a thing on Twitter asking consumers what they were doing about climate change and it was like really Shell <laughs> <laughs> I mean it, it backfired spectacularly as you can imagine but I think it, it's representative I mean, a lot of companies are sort of, you know, yeah, a lot of supermarkets sort of blaming consumers for their plastic packaging, saying, well, consumers want this. And it's like, well, do we? Have you offered us any alternatives? You know, so I think I think the conversation, it's super important that we all, you know, sort of take responsibility for our own waste and our own carbon footprints. But I do think the big changes are going to come from policy changes at government level and from, you know, really big businesses making those shifts. So I do think we need to kind of hold them to account as well. Yeah, absolutely. And how do you see us doing that? Because looking, I mean, especially in England where you are right now and where I grew up, you know, you get your recycling bins, you know, they're provided by the, you know, you obviously you pay your council tax, you get the bins and you th you think you're recycling. OK, I'll put the plastic there. I'll put this waste here. And then it's just job done. It's sorted. Where, in fact, if you look recently, um, I, I was I've seen a few um, articles on the fact that these recycling companies, it's actually incredibly corrupt not only in places like Southeast Asia, but in the UK, in America, in all of these developed countries. And it's, yeah, they weren't really managing the waste correctly. A lot of it was actually getting landfilled. And then they were sending most of it to China or to Southeast Asia, which was in turn getting landfilled on the quiet or dumped in rivers and these types of things. And I think about, about was it about a year ago now, China then turned around and have said, we're not taking this anymore. It's your problem. And yeah. I mean, I've got no idea what, how the government are handling this now, but you know, the fact that the government aren't really taking it seriously, they're just sort of, as you mentioned, this notion of throwing it away, like where is away? It's got to go somewhere. You're clearly not recycling it. Like, how do we even begin to get the governments to take this seriously? They're clearly, they clearly don't seem to care. Or maybe it's not profitable, profitable enough for them at this stage for them to even, you know, give a shit. But how, how do we actually apply the pressure, like to get the governments to change and ultimately the corporations as well? Because that, that's, you know, that's where yeah, the advantage is. Mean I think there's two things. Firstly, a lot of recycling needs to be separated by hand. The technologies are not there yet. So, for example, plastic needs to be recycled separately according to what type of plastic. We, we shouldn't actually use the word plastic. We should say plastics because there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different types of plastic and they need separating before they can be recycled. And the technology is not really there yet to do that uh, very, very cost effectively. So a lot of it gets sent to developing nations where the cost of labor is lower and it can be, and also where the uh, laws around kind of workers' rights are slacker. So one of the ways you can determine which type of plastic something is, is to set fire, fire to it and the way it burns will determine which sort of plastic it is. Obviously that's giving off toxic fumes. Um, so there's two things. There's kind of the low cost of labor, but also the kind of looser regulations around workers' rights. Um, and that's why a lot of waste gets exported to lower wage countries. And, you know, that's another example of just externalizing a problem. We're sort of, you know, letting somebody else deal with it. And I don't really think that's fair. But I think the bigger point is that recycling is not the solution. We are not going to recycle our way out of this problem. There's a, there's a gorgeous little cartoon, which I love. And it sort of says the linear economy. And it sort of says take, make waste, and it all ends up in a dustbin. And then it says recycling. And it, this, this little arrow rather than going straight down just sort of does this and then goes down. And it's right, effectively recycling is just delaying the inevitable. And um, in the name of the book's gone out of my head, but the the book that sort of first explained the idea of a circular economy made the point that you've got to recycle something into 
a material of the same value. Otherwise, it's not recycling, it's downcycling. And most recycling is downcycling. So at best, you're extending the life of that object by 10 months, years. You know, it's, it's not a lot. So actually, what we need to do is move to a circular economy where things aren't recycled, where you're reducing the amount of waste in the first place, where you're keeping objects and materials in use for longer. So things like repair and things like making new things out of waste, giving them a new life. And finally, and the point that tends to get forgotten from the circular economy is the idea of regenerating natural systems. So before the Industrial Revolution, when we made things, we didn't change them compositionally. So things were still recognizably animal, vegetable or mineral, I suppose you could say. You could put them back into the earth and they would rot and provide nutrients for new things to grow. After the Industrial Revolution, we found ways to change materials fundamentally. So there's what they call the heat beat treat model, where we we turn things into you know, kind of a mix up of lots of different materials or a material that's been fundamentally altered since it came out of the earth. So when it goes back into the earth, it's just going to pollute. It's not going to rot and provide nutrients. And again, that's what we need to be looking at right from the beginning, right from the design stage. I'm not sure. Well, I'm, I am sure that recycling is not the solution to this stuff. I think we've got to move away from that model and move towards much more of a kind of zero waste circular economy model. And I think that is a much bigger shift than getting people to recycle properly. It's much harder, but that's what needs doing. Yeah, I think that notion of the sort of biomaterials, these natural materials that just, you know, regardless to where they end up, they will just decompost and there'll be very yeah. minimal um, sort of um, damage to the environment from that. Um, I mean, we're working quite a bit over here with mushrooms and, and developing mushroom leathers and things like that. And, and the issue is, it seems that a lot of brands are looking into this, but they're like, oh, well, it's not scalable and the technology's not there yet. And it's a little bit sort of R&D. However, to, to me, it does feel, you know, that that's where things need to head. And as you mentioned, recycling plastics isn't the future. It's a short term measure for a, a big problem. Um, I mean, are you have you seen much in that space, that sort of bioscience, biomaterial space that you you feel could really cause some great impacts or you could maybe even scale, you know, for brands that are looking for ways of, of changing and finding smarter materials? Do you think there's anything out there that is sort of proven that could be scalable? Yeah, I mean, there are tons and tons and tons. There's actually an amazing website called Materium. Dot org So it's Materium, O-M at the end, um, that has, it's kind of an open source library of biofabrication materials so anybody who's made anything at home or in their own lab or their own studio can pop it up on there and then when other people use it they can add feedback so that's a brilliant resource and just having a little look through that I mean there's everything from things made from eggshells to you know fabrics grown from algae the the innovation in that space is huge and I think one of the difficult things is for designers and manufacturers to keep up with that um, in terms of the scalability, I think there are two things. One, I think a lot of this stuff is more scalable than you think. Um, so the book was originally supposed to be wrapped in the same, uh, when the, the Guardian magazines come in, this sort of potato starch bag that's compostable. And I was like, great, we'll just use that. Um, sadly, it doesn't last long enough because we print all the books up front. The last books to be sold will be in storage for a year or two. And by that point, this will have broken down. But we managed to find another one made from uh, the waste that comes out of sugarcane processing. So it's a sort of a, a ethanol, polyethanol. It's completely biodegradable, compostable and made from sugar. So it's kind of no fossil fuels in there. Um, and funnily enough, I've had a lot of other people using that. And that's a perfectly scalable product. But the other thing is, I think I think the, our kind of obsession with things being scalable is kind of linked to globalization and an economy that's based on growth. Things don't necessarily need to be scalable. We just need lots of little local solutions. So it might be that rather than moving to a model where we have you know, these globalized companies producing biomaterials, it might be actually we take a completely different approach and each local area uses the materials and the, and the waste and the things they can grow locally. And actually what we're sharing is data and information and kind of practices that 
you know, in one country you might be using plantain in another country you might be using bananas in another country, you know, and I think, I think it's that sort of model that's going to become more useful. I think we've got to move away from this idea of sort of constant growth and, and everything being a global scalable solution. I think we need to listen much more to local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, um, and sort of be more responsive to, to what works locally, you know, what can be grown locally, because what we don't want to end up doing is flying all these biomaterials across the planet, creating even more carbon. So, yeah, I completely agree with that. And I think, and you know, even for local economies and local jobs, it's kind of, yeah. you know, brands like Nike, for example, they make, I mean, God knows, maybe most of their shoes in Indonesia where, where we are, but they sell very few here. And I'm sure they get shipped several times around the world and they don't probably don't pay much tax here, if any, you know, all these types of things. Like, what are they doing for the local community? Pretty much nothing. Um, and they owe a lot to Indonesia. So it's kind of the governments really should start now stepping up and saying, OK, if you want to you know, operate globally, that's fine. You want to remain at whatever it is, $60 billion company, that's fine. But you must only sell where you where you manufacture. And set and so you, so they'd be forced to set up all of these different um, factories around the world, and they'd employ jobs, and they'd be they pay tax there, and you know, and, and and hopefully teach people skills, and at the same time develop biomaterials in uh, certain territories, making new economies from that, all these sort of things. So I th I think you're right. I think that's a really good solution, and I hope that brands do start looking into that. You know, and wouldn't it be much more interesting as a consumer, whatever you want to call it? The fact that everywhere is different and you've got to go somewhere to find something you can't get in England and rather than everything being so available and, you know, it just becomes boring. And going back to that almost ethos of having a local scene and people who are making things locally that have their own style, I think surely that's a, you know, it's a much better way of doing things on a lot of levels. Yeah, I mean, high streets have become so homogenized before oh. all of this lockdown craziness. I was doing a lot of travel, going to design fairs something I'm reevaluating, but you know, the, so many European cities, high streets, they all sort of blur into one in my, in my brain, which is such a shame. And I think the, I think the fab cities model is really interesting where everything sort of stays within the ecosystem of that city and they're making things from their own waste and everything's circular. And then it's data that's actually transferring in and out. And I think that's a really interesting model to think about for all sorts of different applications. Yeah, it seems like a much smarter way of doing things, and and it would, and I'm sure there'd be so much new innovation coming from that, you know, creating much more opportunities, and you know, spreading skills to to wider places, and yeah, I mean, and 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 think how exciting the products would be if you okay, we're going to go to Indonesia, but we're only going to use local materials. Well, you've got the, you've got some of the best crafts people in the world in Bali because crafts craft craft here is a way of life. Like literally every every morning they make offerings from banana leaf. You know, there's just by default. They've been practicing geometric domes in baskets and, you know, hand weaving. Everything's done, done naturally. And, you know, if, if, they, if somebody comes here and invests whatever it is, they invest millions of dollars in trying to take this to the next level with technology and, and increasing skills in a more modern context, I think you'd see some pretty amazing products come out of it. So, yeah, there's lots to be, to be learned, I think, and it could be a pretty exciting shift. Yeah, and I think I think those collaborations are key. I think one of the things, you know, the, the question I set myself at university was, can craft save the world? And I think part of that's about hand skills, but part of it is about the mindset of, of craftspeople. And I think collaboration is a is a really key one. We've sort of spent the last couple of hundred years in a very competitive mindset and a very sort of you've got to have a winner and a loser. Whereas I think, you know, the only way we're going to find our way out of this climate crisis is by sharing knowledge and by collaborating and you know sort of a craftsman might come up with a great idea and you know so many of the people in the book have collaborated with a big company to understand and utilize their waste streams they've collaborated with an engineer to help them scale the machinery they're using they've collaborated with a scientist to take the principle of what they're doing and and scale that and so I think there's I think collaboration is a is a really important part of all this. Yeah, it's so important. I mean, we do the, quite a bit of that here in Bali where we invite different designers, but it's not like, okay, bring a bring an overseas designer and let them d do it and then go back to wherever you come from. It's, well, come here, meet the local craftspeople, they'll learn about the materials here, whether that's bamboo or whether that's, you know, carving or weaving. And like we had Max Lam come over quite a few times and he'd come here with an idea of what he was going to do. And then he'd sort of meet, meet different um, people in different fields and he'd come up with something completely different. 
and yeah. and they would sort of show him things he would show them things and there's an exchange there it's a very valuable exchange and then when max goes home there's as i want to mention there's there's almost like a new little industry starting because a craft a, you know some of the crafts people here they're very traditional and all of a sudden if you teach them something with a modern sensibility and they go wow okay this is an interesting way of doing it and then you know, a year later, you see them doing it for other people, and 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 it becomes a bit of a a trend. And you're like, wow, that's that's the value of collaboration. You know, that east meets west exchange of knowledge, exchange of cultures. It's so important. Yeah, and I think that exchange is really important. It's got to be a, a two way dialogue. I think that's what makes those things valuable. Absolutely. And 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 you do. I've seen you've done quite a bit of work in zero waste, not only in your book, but I I I saw that you did. Um, was it zero waste? Um initiative week i think i saw online what what, what was that oh, yeah. you were doing? in september it was zero waste week zero waste week and how does somebody for example that's at home you know start getting interested in sustainability wanting to make some changes where does somebody start in terms of like at home wanting to go zero waste like where, where do you even begin with that i mean there are so many resources online now so i think the first thing to do is to kind of follow a bunch of people on instagram you know have a look at some blogs kind of get some ideas i think the big thing that i found was it's all about planning and preparation you can't just sort of go right now today i'm going to go zero waste it doesn't work like that um i interviewed somebody for my podcast who can fit his entire month's waste in a single jam jar i mean that that's the dream right nice. but the first thing you've got to do is not buy stuff that you're then gonna to have to throw part of away. So there's a, a funny video I saw about these girls trying to make a zero waste pizza and they were hunting through the supermarket trying to find a tomato that didn't have a sticker on it because then they were gonna to have to throw the sticker away, right? <laughs> and it's the same thing, you know, when you go into the supermarket, so much of our fresh produce is wrapped in plastic. So you need to try and find things that aren't wrapped in plastic. Um, there are popping up all over the UK and I would imagine elsewhere in the world as well now, these refill stores where you take your own containers. So you take your own kiln jar and fill it up with flour or fill it up with plastic um, pasta. Um, there's an amazing new initiative um, from a company called Forgo who've worked out that most uh, beauty and kind of cleanliness products are shipping water all around the world using up lots of carbon and we've all got tap water in our own homes so they've come up with a hand wash where you get a uh, you buy one special pump which is refillable and then they just give you a, a sachet of powder and you put the powder in add your own tap water give it a shake and then that's your hand wash so you've got no packaging after your initial bottle other than the little paper sachet and they're not shipping heavy products all over the world. The next time you buy one, you're just buying one of those sachets. And I just think there's so many clever, um, you know, things like that coming out now. Solid soap is another one. And it, actually old fashioned soap. We all used to use soap before we started using these hand washes. And someone gave me a great tip, which is if you, if you take the a bottle top, you know, like a metal bottle top off a beer bottle and stick it into the bottom of your soap, your soap won't get slimy on the bottom, which is usually why people hate soap, right? So there's so many little tips and tricks and hacks. And, you know, at Christmas, there's the idea of wrapping presents in fabric that can then be reused, um, all sorts of things. I think it's just a question of sort of, the first thing you've got to do is actually look at your rubbish bin and, and your recycling, because we also need to re reduce how much, not how much we recycle, but by percentage, but, you know, we want to ideally be having less waste going out of the door in either way and just kind of work out what it is, where the problems are. My big problem is, is food waste, not as in edible food, but things like banana skins and the middle bits of peppers. And apparently you can make a, a vegan pulled pork from shredded banana skins, but I haven't tried that yet. Wow. Um, my dog gets a lot of it. That's <laughs> kind of how I get rid of all the carrot tops and cucumber ends and that sort of thing. But yeah, I think it's just a, I think you've got to make it fun. I think it's got to become something that's a, a fun challenge rather than a than a chore. Because at the end of the day, as I said earlier, our individual consumer actions are not going to save the world. I think the purpose of doing this stuff is to understand it better and give us the personal agency that then we can go to the supermarkets and say, I don't want this because it's in a plastic wrapper or we can write to our local MP or our local government official and say this legislation needs to change. So I think for me, the purpose of doing it was more of a sort of educational journey that would then help me to, you know, obviously inform the book, but also help me to kind of take on more of a, a role as a citizen rather than a consumer, I think. 
Yeah, I guess a lot of it is just trying to avoid the supermarket and, you know, shopping elsewhere that don't sell things in plastic. And I know maybe it's more yeah, difficult in some I parts think, of the world, but... You know, it would be great if we could all shop at farmer's markets and refill stores, but they're expensive. That's not viable for everybody. And so I think that's why, you know, there was a, a programme on TV in this country recently where Hugh Fernley Whittingstall took a sandwich carton, which says on the side, widely recyclable, but actually it's lined with plastic. So unless you can pull the plastic off the cardboard, which you can't, you know, he spent quite a long time demonstrating that's pretty much impossible. It can't be recycled. Now, you know, for people who are kind of out and about and busy and need to grab a sandwich, who can't afford to go to the lovely artisan, you know, wrapped in paper coffee shop, that's possibly their only option. Well, the supermarkets should be addressing that and creating something. Do you know what I mean? So I think I think there's a danger that all this stuff becomes a bit middle class. And I think if we're going to change everything, we need everybody and we have to have solutions that are affordable. So, so in the UK now, then, is there no sort of traditional, I mean, maybe because I haven't been there for 10 years, is there no traditional sort of green grocers that on farmers markets that are just on the high street selling fruit and veg that are just or is that pretty much gone now? No, I mean there are. It depends where you are. There are places in London that they I think they describe them as fresh food deserts where there are just no fresh fruit or vegetable available to buy. You know, and all you've got is kind of chicken shops and supermarkets and so there are places where it's not possible to buy fresh fruit and veg at all let alone fresh fruit and veg that are not packaged there are equally places where there are hundreds of greengrocers you know on every corner and so it depends it depends where you are in the country i think um and there are big pockets of poverty where that stuff just isn't available and there are pockets where that stuff is readily available and affordable and then there are pockets where it's i mean where i live I, my choice is between farm shops and supermarkets and the farm shops are super expensive so it's kind of it depends where you are i think and and on the subject of retail is there anywhere like some of these kind of clever clever items and products that you're talking about or even some of the stuff in your book where where does somebody sort of buy this sort of stuff if you're interested in looking at, at circular design items or zero waste products where where is there anywhere available that's sort of selling all of this stuff an amazing shop in London called the Home of Sustainable Things um, and they stopped the book um, but they've got all sorts of amazing stuff that you really can't get in very many places um, so I would definitely suggest checking them out if you're in London um, a lot of the designers and makers in the book have their own shops online um, so again I think kind of following people on Instagram and buying direct from makers is a great way to support small craftspeople um, so yeah there are more more places um, and I think in the run up to Christmas I've been really sort of encouraging people to shop small shop local shop independent and kind of support some of those little independent makers rather than defaulting to the sort of online giants um, but a lot increasingly particularly over lockdown I think a lot of those small businesses and small independent shops got online and built websites so I think there's it's become much more accessible even in the last six nine months that's good yeah I think definitely supporting local makers and you know your kind of people within your community is so important right now absolutely um, and on, on the subject, um, a different type of waste, space waste, which I saw yes. a picture in your book, and it's something we've actually been looking at quite a bit here. We're doing a video around it at the moment. Is that something you've you've looked into? Because it's a pretty big problem, right? I mean, it's we don't think about it because it's kind of up there and not down here, but it's it's a critical mass, and it seems like it's a big, big issue that's only going to get worse. Is that something you've looked into? Or have you seen anybody doing anything around that? I mean, I haven't looked at it in any great depth. I'm certainly not an expert, but as you will have read, the, the kind of structure of the introduction was this idea that we create waste when it crosses a boundary. So the first boundary is our own skin. We're quite comfortable with our bodily fluids while they're inside our skin, but the moment they cross that boundary, they become disgusting. And then the next boundary was our own homes, our city walls, our state lines, the coastlines, and eventually the atmosphere. And yeah, I mean, there is, everything we've ever put into space is still up there, basically. So there are currently two and a half thousand operational satellites, but there are 34,000 pieces of debris more than four inches wide and millions and millions and millions of pieces of tiny debris. And you might think that like a little screw couldn't do that much damage, but if you think how fast it might be traveling in space, yeah. um, it's actually posing genuine problems for modern space flight. Um, and then Elon Musk is just putting up hundreds more satellites, you know, so I think we need some sort of coordinated strategy globally as to what's going up there. 
Um, but in February, the first commercial satellite that wasn't designed to be repaired or docked has actually, they've created a satellite that's gone out, docked with it, repaired it and sent it off again. So that's going to extend its life by five years, after which point they will have to just kind of boot it out of our kind of closest bit of orbit. So it's sort of out the way. But that's starting. So I'm, I'm kind of hopeful. I think essentially it needs the same approach that everything else has got. You know, all the stuff we've been talking about, we've got to design things, thinking about what happens to them after they're, they're done. We can't just sort of leave them floating up there forever. I mean, in the 70s, NASA actually looked at shooting our nuclear waste into space. Thank God they decided it was too expensive. But, um, you know, it's... I it, it, guess it's, it's the same idea of a way, right? Where is a way? So, yeah, I think it, it needs the same kind of approach as everything else we've been looking at. We have to think about kind of what, what happens after the end of its life and, and how are we dealing with that and who's taking responsibility for that. Yeah, I wonder if NASA could somehow try and collect it all and give it to, like, I don't know, Tom Sachs or something and say, make a big giant installation or do do something with it or, or, or make something new out of it, yeah. And, but yeah, that notion of making something new out of something old, what, what, what's the most sort of craziest thing, whether that's in your book or that you've seen of people that have made something from, you know, whether it's waste or, you know, a discarded material, what's, what's the most sort of craziest thing that you've seen out there that you think, wow, I can't believe they did that? So much crazy stuff. I mean, there's an awful lot of people making stuff out of poo now, which, you know, God bless them. It's not a job I want. <laughs> But, you know, I, I love those problems. There's a there's a uh, an example in the book of a designer called James Shaw, who actually convinced a big recycling facility in London to give him the waste off their floors. So, you know, even when we do recycle things properly, there are still bits that slip through. And he made this extrusion gun. So you tip these plastic pellets in the top and then he kind of squirts it out like Play-Doh and almost draws furniture in 3D with these sort of squirty noodly strands um, that then set into these I mean, kind of crazy looking objects. But I, I think that that's quite interesting just as a completely different way of, of doing something. Um, there's another girl in the book who's using moths to digest um, keratin-based fibers so kind of silk wool cashmere anything that's come from an animal and then makes little brooches out of their droppings so I mean there's all sorts of crazy stuff um and I think it's all interesting you know it all helps to shift our perception even if it's not necessarily I mean I don't think any of the pro projects in the book claim to have you know all the solutions to to these big problems but they each tackle a little bit and I think they each help to shift our perception and the idea that waste can actually be a valuable resource yeah, I think that's the key. I think no one's claiming to be perfect, but the fact that they're actually doing it and starting a conversation and sort of wowing people in the process, I think it's a great start. So, yeah, hats off to them and long may continue. Um, but, yeah, Katie, it's been so good um, chatting to you. I really appreciate you taking the time. It's been super interesting, so insightful, and I've, I've been loving your book. It's um, I've, I've ordered quite a few copies for Christmas presents for family and friends, and, yeah, I'm excited to hand those out. So yeah, just just on a final note, just before you, we head off, any advice for the young, you know, the young writers or young designers today coming through that maybe want to create positive impacts? Could you give any words of wisdom with a woman of your experience and knowledge that you could pass down? Yeah, I mean, I think the advice I always give to writers is to write, and that sounds silly, but I think often people sort of wait for permission. They wait you know, to get a gig for a magazine or the barriers to writing have never been lower. You know, you can set up your own blog for free, set up your own Instagram account and just start getting your words out there. And that will make you a better writer for a start practice. You know, just writing every day will help you to hone your ideas, help you to understand what you think. And it will also help you to get spotted. I started out with a blog and that's how I, and I'm and my own magazine, in fact, and that's how I eventually ended up to, you know, getting the, the work I'm getting I think the other thing I would advise young writers to do is to do their research this is an incredibly complex field and that's not to put anybody off but there's an awful lot of nonsense out there so I think it's kind of super important to adhere to sort of basic journalistic standards of checking sources and all of those sorts of things um and you know kind of the same advice for new designers um it's harder obviously you need kind of materials you need space you need you need kit but again I think things like 
you know, Etsy, Kickstarter, being able to build websites and set up social media profiles so easily, the barriers are a lot lower than they used to be. Um, and I think, I think it's about kind of in the early days, really sticking to your ethics and sticking to your principles. I think it's really easy to sort of think, oh, I'm just gonna have to do that for the money because, you know, I need to, I can do this thing that's not great in order to fund this thing that is. And I think, I think it's kind of, it's really important to decide what you believe in and what you stand for early on and, and stick to that. And that will make it much harder in the early days of your career, but it will pay off in multitude when you eventually kind of reach that, reach that tipping point. That's great advice. And I completely agree. Stick by what you stand for and it'll all, it'll all kind of, you know, the, the work will sort of come, come good in the end. Amazing. Katie, thank you so much. It's been super insightful. And once again, congrats on the book. And we'll, um, yeah, we'll, we'll keep in touch and hopefully speak again soon. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Absolute Amazing. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.